now uh, we'll move on, but I just want to say I'm sure some of you download the um, the recordings all at once. That's fine. But I bet some of you, I wanted to leave on that nice, long, dramatic pause from the last recording. I wanted you to stop and think for minutes and minutes upon end without my stupid voice interrupting your interesting thoughts. But I bet some of you in iTunes or however you're listening to this, it just jumped from the dramatic pause right into this recording. So I have to say, if that happened, you have to pause the recording now and let this sink in. You don't have to believe this argument. There are some problems with this argument, although it's pretty darn watertight. But I just want you to see sort of how magnificent it is, this, this like hat trick sort of that, that Descartes just pulled off. Not only did he find a way to say that there's something other than himself in the world, and not just that he believes the tree across the street is really there, but he can be certain that this thing he's talking about exists, but it was God of all things that he proved. So the, the, uh, the chutzpah, the, the, the guts of this move, and the, the mental skill to link all those various things together is actually incredibly impressive. So if you haven't yet, just let that sink in for a while. And like I said, rehearse the moves and basically see, do you believe that he just proved God? With certainty, do you think that he proved God, the existence of God? So a few more details that both help explain better what he means and will partly uh, answer to possible objections to his points. And this is basically pages um, 31 through the end, 36. So just one thing I want to point out is that um, page 35 and page 33... It can be very confusing when he talks about his parents, when he talks about dear old mom and dad. Sometimes Descartes is talking about where he got the idea of God. And that's what we just did. That's what we focused on entirely. So sometimes Descartes is saying, where did I get this idea of God? And that's the real core point of the third meditation. Other times, though, Descartes is also talking about physical existence. For instance, at the top of page 33. Both of those are important, but one, uh, the, what we just went over in great detail, where did you get the idea of God from? What caused the idea of God in you? That's much more important. Two, don't get them confused. Because there's, uh, how do I say this? He's making different arguments with different steps when he's talking about the cause of his existence. When he's talking about the cause of the idea of God, he's making a different argument with different steps. So imagine, let's make it be like dance steps, right? Uh, you're doing the Cuban shuffle or something, right? And it's got, you, you turn to the left, you turn to the left. If you started doing in the middle of it, the dance of like a waltz or something, well, it, it'd totally screw you up, right? Both have steps in an order. If you start moving from one to the other in the middle, you'll just totally mess yourself up. So I'm just going to say this now. I'll repeat it. Sometimes in the third meditation, Descartes is talking about the cause of his actual existence, like that he's physically around. That's usually about mom and dad, parents. When he's talking about the existence of the idea or, yeah, the cause of the idea of God in his head, it's really a different argument, even though it sounds very similar. So that's just a heads up not to get those two parts confused, because it's super easy. A lot easier than switching over to a waltz in the middle of the Cuban shuffle, as a matter of fact. Okay, so that's important. Oh, here's another thing that's really important. This is part of how, we, uh, how Descartes insists that the idea of God is so big that you could not have caused it yourself. So, some people will say to Descartes, often it's people who don't believe in God, um, sometimes though it's people who believe in God who insist that 
it must be a matter of faith rather than an uh, something which can be proven by, say, math or philosophy in this case. And they'll say, no, 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 I could dream up, I could imagine an idea of God. And just in the same way I can imagine a unicorn, it's just me taking stuff I've already seen or experienced or hallucinated, it doesn't matter, and sticking them together. So I take, you know, my dad's deep voice and I take the rumble of thunder and then I have God speaking to Moses, right? Or I take um, the feeling I get sometimes when I've done something wrong, that, that pang of guilt, and I join that to the idea of time going on forever. Boom, I got the idea of heaven or hell, whatever it would be. This is what Descartes says, though. He goes, hold up. The idea of God is not just th like things, right, that we think about God. He says the idea of God is actually technically the definition of God is what he's talking about. Right? So he's not saying that Hindus and Christians and atheists agree on what God looks like or if God said something to Moses or what God said to Moses if he did. He's just saying, give me, if you can, a definition of what God would be if it exists. People always will say, all-knowing, all-powerful, not subject to death, etc. Right? That's what he means by the idea of God. It would be the definition of God if God were a thing. Because hypothetically we're pretending now we don't know if Descartes believes it's a thing or not. And he says, those ideas, not a burning bush, not um, uh, uh, the adventures of um, Shiva in the early times of the universe, right? Uh, not um, Aaron and Moses, etc., etc., not those things. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what would be the essence of God if God were real. And I know this sounds... That's just not what most people mean when they talk about God. But remember, he's... That's his method here. He's trying to clear out any possible error. And just like himself, he isn't asking what color his socks are right now. He's not asking about God, how big was the burning bush? How long did it burn for? No, 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 no. Those, it's so easy to be wrong about those kinds of details. But he says, oh, what's my essence? What is my definition? That was what he did earlier. And he says, I am defined as a thinking thing. You remember that? He doesn't ask how many fingers he has. He doesn't ask what his birthday is. It's so easy to be wrong about that kind of stuff. But essences and basic definitions, they're really easy to get right. You'd never define yourself as like a purple people eater or something, right? You'd never define yourself as the world's fastest car, right? <laughs> And as long as you think about it for a second, he thinks, you'll realize that thought is inseparable from your essence. The other things might be real and true. You probably are wearing socks right now. You probably do have fingers right now. But he says, no, no, no. We'll start with the essence, the definition. And that's a standard ph philosophy move. We ask about the big definition to get it right. Then we descend to details. And just like Descartes, if we really get our definition, our first general step correct, we're so much more likely to be right about the details when we get to them. So, drawing all that together, applying it back to God. When he says you have the idea of God, he doesn't mean your memories of church. He doesn't mean um, the last thing you heard when you were in synagogue, right? That's not what he's talking about. That's all real stuff. It's just not what he's concerned with here. He says, what would be the definition of God? What would a God essentially be? Well, surely something much bigger than you. Surely something much smarter than you. Surely something which can do things that you can't. I mean bigger in that metaphorical sense. Surely something which existed before you in time. 
and surely something that can do things that are impossible for you. And yet you have the idea in you of something that is that big. This is what Descartes says is you can think perfection. The base, the most basic definition of God, if you pare it down as small and tight as you can, as like diamond uh, hard and compressed as you can, the definition of God would be perfection. And he says, no offense, buddy, but you are imperfect. And yet you got the idea of perfection. So you're a human being who got all this heat in you. Where'd you get it from? The campfire, which is much hotter than you are. You're a ball, uh, a billiard ball, who left your own devices. It's pretty cool. You're very round. You have a nice color. But you don't have any motion, right? The billiard ball by itself is imperfect in, sen in terms of motion. So if it's going to start moving... It's got to get that energy from somewhere outside of itself. Something with more motion than it has by itself. You see? It's not just, oh, what was the first time you heard uh, of God? Oh, it was church. God built the church. No, 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 no. It's that you basically, your mind is alive with motion. Some of those motions could be caused by other things. Picture a body of water. That's caused by the times you've seen bodies of water. Now, think this idea of perfection. Perfection in time, perfection in knowledge, perfection in power. Eternity, omnipotence, and omniscience. Perfection in time, perfection in power, perfection in knowledge. You don't have those yourself, and yet you can think them. That is... You don't have the power to cause those things yourself, and yet you have them as you, as, in you as an effect. You got the notion of perfection from somewhere, and it wasn't from looking at yourself in the mirror. It came from somewhere with at least as much heat, motion, whatever, perfection as the idea itself. Now, he adds two things, and this is towards the end of our reading. It's page 35. Yeah. And he says, remember, we have three basic ideas, or three basic ways that ideas can happen. They can be innate, that is, inherent in you from the beginning. They can be caused by yourself. Or they can be caused by external objects. Now, uh, before I said that God is an external object who caused this idea in you, uh, forgive me for that. That's not entirely accurate. He definitely caused the idea in you. But you see how it's sort of inaccurate to call God an external object? Like he's some tree on the corner or something like that? So this is what, this is what Descartes says. He says we've got three basic options. You're born with the idea in you. You made it up at some point yourself. Or some external thing in the world caused the idea in you, which is basically sensation. Right? He says, ideas which are adventitious or are caused by external objects usually come as sort of a surprise. Right? You look over and you go, oh, wow, that's bright. And he says, does the idea of perfection, the idea of God, feel like that kind of idea? That you just turned around one day and you're like, ow, I stubbed my toe on the idea of God's perfection. New. No. Right? So he says, okay, it's not caused by external objects. And he says, we know that it's not the second option. We know it wasn't invented by you and your imagination. Because it's bigger than you. You couldn't make something that big up from your finite smallness. I like to say, you don't have that kind of juice, you know, you don't have that kind of power. And he says, okay, third option. Remember, if there's three possible things and you rule out one and two, it's guaranteed to be the third option. If there's three kinds of M&Ms and it's impossible for it to be the first one and it's impossible for it to be the second one, you know it has to be the third. That's just logic. 
So it's not caused by some external object because it doesn't shake you, uh, it doesn't catch you by surprise, and it doesn't come through your, what seem to be your senses. You didn't cause it yourself. That's the main thing we talked about because you're not as big as the idea is. It's bigger than you. So then, boom, one and two are ruled out as impossible. That makes the third one innate necessary. This idea has been planted in you from all time before you ever opened your eyes. You did not create it because you're not powerful enough. So one, it's innate inside of you. That's why so many cultures have ideas of God that basically revolve around perfection. They all have that idea snuck inside of them before they ever even know what they're thinking. Second, the cause of this particular idea has to actually be the content of the idea. Perfection must have a perfect cause. So, with a little more detail about that, I sort of repeated and extended what I said in the, the prior recording. Once more, please pause the recording and think about that. Okay. So, I have a few questions. They're sort of opposite questions, and you can answer either or both in the discussion. One is, if you believe in God, do you find anything appealing about the idea of proving the existence of God? Okay, so I'll repeat that. If you personally believe in God, do you find anything appealing about attempts to prove the existence of God? So you notice here, Descartes didn't just say, oh, I've been raised Catholic my whole life. He was Catholic. He didn't just say, oh, the, the world would be a better place if there's God, so I hope God is real. He didn't just say, uh, I want it to be true or I feel like it's true. He said, it can't be false. He checked the numbers. The idea had to come from somewhere. It must come from somewhere big. It came from God. Do you feel, if you believe in God, that you, basically, do you gain anything from that? Or does that feel weird to you? Do you feel that God doesn't need to be proved? Or that this particular proof somehow, you know, diminishes God? So if you believe in God, how, how do you take this attempt by Descartes to prove the existence of God? That's the first question. Pause the recording again, if you would. Reflect on that. And here, the, the second idea that's sort of, you know, the, the, the opposite almost of that one is, well, wait a second. Maybe some of you would deny that you in fact have this idea of perfection in your heads. Or some of you might say, mm, I don't think that Hindus or the ancient Greeks define their gods as perfection. They would define them, you know, some other way. Or you might say, yeah, Descartes, you're right. I didn't get the idea of God from myself. You're right. I got it from church, family members, religious books. So I didn't cause it. You're right about that, Descartes. But that doesn't mean that God caused it. Maybe it was caused by, you know, like a work of fiction or something. So the other way... Remember, first I basically asked you, do you care about a proof of God for God's existence? The other way is I'm saying, well, maybe this idea that God's self caused this idea in you doesn't work for you. So does anyone, and you don't have to believe it or not, or sorry, let me rephrase, play devil's advocate with this, right? Um, argue against his idea that God caused the idea of God's perfection in each and every one of us. And this is always how philosophy works. If you argue against that, it should be understood by everybody in the class that you are trying to have fun with what Descartes said. You're trying to think the ideas and say something interesting about them. Not that you don't believe in God or anything like that. Not even that you think Descartes is wrong. Right? It's just we always do this in philosophy. You go through the idea and you give it a fair hearing. You give it the best, most charitable reading, it's called, and you try to see if the idea might be true. And that's what I did. You saw me just really sell Descartes there, right? How great this idea is. Then, when you're done with that, you do the opposite. 
you go back through, you retrace your steps, and you say, wait a second, maybe one of these things that I read so nicely and charitably is actually false. So then you, you got you to gotta pick on the idea, right? And see if it can stand up to your scrutiny. So whether you believe in God or not, whether Descartes your favorite philosopher, your most hated person ever, we're going to do this other thing now. Go back through and try to find some holes in his argument. Say, no, there isn't a perfect uh, cause of this idea. Something else is happening. And really, if you do all that, You've done quite a lot for this session. Okay. So that's going to be our recording today. It's it's a bit shorter than last time by quite a lot. Okay. And partly that's because there's so much for you to slowly process on your own this time. So this class is much shorter by design. That also means though you have to try to think through the things I I gave you here. Okay. So that's enough about the third meditation. We will move on uh, with more Descartes after this. Thank you everyone. Uh, Goodbye.